I also knew I wanted a, a product that was kind of like wine because if you don't own land and you don't own a farm, and maybe some of you guys already do and you're doing a different kind of farming and you're just going to add aquaculture to your portfolio, but if you're somebody like me that doesn't, it's very hard to break into the, to become a farmer. It seems like it shouldn't be very hard, but it is. I mean, to be able to go out and buy the property and afford all the, you know, you don't make your money. Like, it's not like owning a bookstore and bringing money in the second you open your door. You know, like it's, it's a longer turnaround. So I knew I needed a product kind of like wine. Wine, you don't need a lot of space, and it's a high dollar product. Um, because I didn't have the land resources to be able to grow soybeans as a commodity, basically. So I was looking for that kind of, that kind of um, pro product. Um, take, a lot of times we don't acknowledge our own natural uh, skills <coughs> and our own uh, things that we have th that help us out or that are already in our, they're already in our portfolio, I guess, of, of things. So taking stock of your existing skills and contacts is really, is really important. It's good to even sit down and write it out, truthfully. Um, so I was in the food and wine business. I, I felt like those people were my tribe. I knew how, I knew how, that, uh, I knew how that worked. So I knew I would be able to sell my product, that I would be able to, I, to uh, use the existing contacts I had in the food and wine business. And, you know, that's a nice little club. And they all, and it's, you know, if they love you, they tell somebody else about you. So I knew I would be able to grow the business in that way. Um, to be flexible but persistent is really important as well. So flexible, you know, we got in. So I'm sorry, I didn't even tell you what we do. We raise American paddlefish for caviar production. Um, so uh, being flexible but persistent. So f flexible meaning, for instance, somebody approached me when we first got started in the early days about selling our fish as an aquarium fish. I never considered that in a million years that I would do that. But it sounded like a good idea, and we did it. And it, you know, my goal is to sell enough little fingerlings that it pays for my feed bill for the rest of the year. For the, so it's not, it's not something that I'm going to maybe just switch over to, but it's a nice part of my portfolio. And if I wouldn't have been open to that idea, and there's a learning curve on everything that you do. You know, like the first 200 fish we shipped, one box, two boxes, they were alive. The rest of the boxes didn't live. And so I had to learn a lot about how to ship fish and taking it to the airport, and there was some loss. But I was willing to do that. I was willing to do that. And being persistent, that's the other thing. You can't believe how many times um, you're going to, when you run into a wall, it's very easy to think, oh, this is a solid wall, not this is something that can be overcome. I, I don't know if that makes any sense. I had a winemaker, George Hendry, who I loved. He was, uh, when I, he was in the market. We were working the market one day when I was in the wine business, and I told him about my crazy you know, paddlefish caviar idea. And he said, uh, my, my best piece of advice for you is that every harvest, something will go wrong disastrously wrong and don't waste any time feeling sorry for yourself go straight to the fix that sounds really obvious but when you're in the middle of one spectacular <laughs> disaster it's very easy to start saying I wonder if I should be doing this or not you know like is this the right thing for me this is is this too hard is it too um, I'd even have friends of mine that would say oh Renee I don't know I think I think the universe is telling you that this is something that you shouldn't be doing you know and I was and I would always think well maybe the universe is telling me I need to be stronger you know so I guess being persistent is really and and the flexibility again that's one of the reasons why I wanted to get into farming I knew a lot of farmers that were in uh, really good shape physically and mentally into their 80s and you know I hope I live a nice long time I might not but I wanted some sort of uh, path, some sort of good work that would allow me to maybe possibly have that lifestyle. Because you're constantly coming up with solutions to problems that present themselves. Um, especially in an industry that's as new as aquaculture um, or something like we're doing that's a new industry specifically to the paddlefish. So I don't know if that helps you or not, but I found those things to be very helpful in the very early days when we got started. Um, a good friend of mine, I guess I'll call him a friend now. Um, so we used to have business cards that had our logo on it and our address and all that stuff. And I gave him a business card once and he said, that's great, I have no idea what you do. Your business card needs to say exactly what you do. So we just got these, and, and you know, actually it took me a while to really 
know what I did. You know, like for the longest time people would say, what do you do? Oh, I have an aquaculture business, I raise food fish, I raise this. Really what I am is I'm a caviar rancher. So um, this is a little story about how we uh, started making caviar. And I always love the Chinese proverb, be careful what you wish for, because you just might get it. <laughs> it's kind of good, kind of bad. So the way that we did this, when, we, when I got started, I lived in the city. Um, so I, we had a little city house. And um, I have to give a lot of credit to Kentucky State University. They were my research school. I was living in northern Kentucky at the time. And they really, Dr. Steve Mims was the lead researcher on the aquaculture of American paddlefish. And this was something they were doing at the university, where they would, they proposed this idea of going to cities that had um, water treatment places, and they had empty tanks. Um, now, they're under a certain obligation to demolish those tanks after a certain amount of time. But a lot of times, the cities expand. They, they favor the round tanks now. If you see anybody building water treatment, it's always round tanks. So I went to a couple. I found one that, that would let me do it. And I said, I would like to raise fish in one of these empty tanks. And they said, sure, go ahead. So it was, a, it was using an existing resource. That, that really is the thread that's through all of this uh, project, is being able to use an existing resource because if I had to build those, I wouldn't, I would kept me out of game from the very beginning. So I had 200,000 gallon tanks that I got to rear my um, paddlefish in for the first, first year. So uh, we put our fry in. Um, I have more pictures in this, but it, was, it wasn't transferring over a bit. Our fry, they look like uh, little grains of rice. They're super small. So we put the fry into the tanks. Usually, so these tanks are about 16 feet deep. Um, and maybe there's uh, two feet of water that we start off with when the fish are really small. And again, I have to uh, credit Kentucky State. What they found is that if you feed them Daphnia when they're fry, um, they have a higher uh, chance of survival. If you put a pellet in, like a little, you know, they use fry food for um, fry, and it kind of sinks down. Paddlefish are a little blind, so they can't find that very quickly. And then you have to be really careful about your water quality because unused feed will become ammonia, so you have, you know, which is toxic. So what we did is we would, we would gather, I have a, like a Daphnia collecting net, and it's a little bit gruesome work, really, because I'm at a wastewater treatment plant when I'm collecting Daphnia. But I would collect Daphnia, and I would put the Daphnia into the tank, and Daphnia looks like, um, like a red fleck of pepper, but it's an animal. So, uh, and uh, it swims around, and paddlefish love it. So we would put the Daphne in the tank and they would eat it and our survival rates were really, really good. Now once they get big enough, once they got big enough, about this big, that their throat was large enough to swallow a floating pellet, we would switch them over. But the, the feeding Daphnia from the beginning was really game changing. Um, Where did you get the Daphnia from? Water treatment plants. I would, treatment. I would ask, I would call and I would say, so Daphnia in water treatment is always a sign of good water because if there's heavy metals in it, it won't live. Mm -hmm. Now the water treatment plants don't love it because it counts as a particle in their effluent, even though it's not a, a bad thing, it still counts as far as, uh, is it FDA, FDA standards? So they really, they don't mind them when you're collecting it, for one thing, because they don't like it there anyway. And I would just, you know, I would sign a waiver that says if I fell in and killed myself, they weren't responsible, and, and uh, they would let me collect it. And then I put it in a, I had a little hauling box. My husband made, my first hauling box, my husband made for me out of um, plywood. We insulated it. We put some foam in there, a little black plastic, had a lid, a couple holes for uh, a small tube of oxygen. I would put the Daphne in. I would transport it back on oxygen because I was working out of two plants at that point. And then I would put it into my tank. I would siphon it into the tank. And uh, Daphnia is one of those things that has a really short life cycle. And they can all turn, they can spontaneously all turn female, too, if, they, if there's not enough of them. So if you get enough of them in there, it does seem like they support a population over time. Not enough to support big fish, but, but it was, uh, you know, it, I think they even just like go to the wall. Because we would clean the tanks out at the end of every year. But sometimes when you would fill them back up again, seems like there was Daphnia in there. So I don't know if, I don't, I'm not a scientist, 
I, I appreciate it. I like to uh, observe things, and I'm a good. If a, if somebody tells me I need to do something to keep my fish healthy, I, I'm I'm very disciplined about doing it. But some of the stuff about why I don't I just don't care about. It. It's just the way I'm made. I don't know. So, um, so we would when they got about that big, we'd switch them to a floating pellet. This is the most traditional part of aquaculture that we do. So, two aerators, four diffusers in the tank uh, with a big compressor that they let me keep in the basement. We just ran all of it on hoses. Um, we would, uh, uh, I, I, I tried a million things. The filamentous algae was always a problem, you know, for us. It would get in the, it just, you know, it seemed like one day it would just be there. So we did shade cloth. Um, that was another really good thing that I learned. Water treatment people are really nice guys. That's the other thing. And if you get a water treatment catalog, if you know somebody who works in water treatment, it's, it's like half of what you're going to buy from the aquaculture catalogs. And a lot of times it's the same stuff, truthfully, to use. So we did the shade cloth to try to keep the filamentous algae down. I would, um, uh, Dr. Mims told me that the algae would only grow like 18 inches. So we would experiment a lot with just lowering the water, letting it dry out, putting the water up really high. Anything, we, any strategy we could do. A lot of times we'd have to just get a big rake in there and twirl it like spaghetti and pull it out, you know. And it seemed like it would just go it would happen quite quickly. But, so that, those were, you know, feeding every day. Paddlefish only eat at night, so I would go out at night. Um, we would have our, have our aerators and diffusers just on a little timer like you would use for your lights when you're on vacation. And I would have everything get turn, turn off for an hour. I would feed, and then I would leave, and it would just come back on, on its own. I had access, it sounds a little gross to do it in a water treatment plant, but I had access to water that was discharge quality. So it had just gone through UV sterilization. If you, you can't, the average person can't afford that kind of sterilization for water, truthfully. It didn't destroy, um, so it wasn't drinking quality yet. So there was still, you know, healthful bacteria, but there were no viruses or nothing that would get you sick. Plus, anytime I wanted to see what the water looked like, I could just go into their little building where they keep everything on a constant chart for FDA because they have to monitor all that stuff. So I could see what the temperature was, what the oxygen was, what the acidity, or not acidity, the, um, thank you, <laughs> yes, the pH. So, uh, and, and so I, I would have a good, you know, a good, uh, and we tried a couple different things. That's, you know, anything, any system you decide to do, just be, just experiment all the time. It's really the fun part about it. What, this worked pretty well, how can I make it work better? Um, and then I would always lower the tank a third about every other week and put fresh water in. That's how I, I kept the water, you know, healthy. But I never had to clean any garbage out at the bottom. I mean, the water, every, all the waste and everything, it didn't really affect the water quality. We would wait till the end of the year when we pulled the fish out, hose it down with a fire hose. It would just go all the way through the water treatment plant again and then be discharged. Um, so at the end of the season, September, October, we have about a one pound to a two pound fish. They grow really fast because they're very big fish. Here, I'll, this is a little book if you want to look at that and pass it around, but it's kind of a little bit about what we do. Um, so we, uh, I do everything on contract with other people. I have uh, lakes in Ohio and Kentucky and I go to them and I say, you have this beautiful body of water and it's, uh, it's a passive resource for you, and I could turn it into a productive resource for you. So um, basically the way I set my contracts up is I assume all the liability and all the cost. They don't, have, they don't have any cost to it at all. And if everything goes spectacularly wrong and I don't get one fish, they have no liability to that. Um, but if they let me put the fish in, then at the end, when we harvest, I give them a percentage of the uh, of the of the um, price that I receive for my finished product. So we take the fish out of the tanks, um, we haul them on oxygen to the lakes that we have under contract, and then we release them and let them forage for 10 years. It takes a really long time because they're a prehistoric fish, and so they reach sexual maturity very slowly. Um, so <coughs> you can't even tell if you've got male or female fish for four or five years. So you, they just go in. Um, I tell people I'm in the egg business, you know, caviar is fish eggs, and there's a big difference between a grocery store egg and a free range egg. If, if any of you guys have chickens, you know what I'm talking about. And so uh, I, I do free range caviar, basically, it's the way that I'm looking at it. Um, these fish would never be, oh, I think I did have a slide on that, why it works. 
The reason why it works is paddlefish are so large, by the time we put them in at a pound or a pound and a half, they're pretty safe from predation. Um, there could be... Um, there could be a bigger fish, a big, you know, a bass or something maybe, that, but not too many. I mean, they're pretty, they're, their rostrum is, they're pretty long. They're like 18, 24 inches by the time we put them in. Um, they, they eat zooplankton in the lake. So if you can see their mouth structure, they're like a whale. So just like a sperm whale eats krill, the paddlefish filter for zooplankton, that little tiny um, organism. And they just swim with their mouth open and they filter for it. So they're not really uh, competing with any kind of other fish in the lake. Um, they're not interested in anything that would be like sport fishing um, because they don't eat anything that you would put in on a hook. They're not in interested. So uh, the chances of them interfering with sport fishing is really low. Uh, they won't reproduce in a lake because they're a river fish. So they need, they need current and gravelly bottom for reproduction. If for some reason we don't get the fish out when they're old enough to produce eggs. The females just reabsorb the eggs into their body as a source of nutrition, and then they egg up again next year, but they won't lay the eggs. So pretty much you know exactly as many. They wouldn't be there unless you put them there, and you're going to pull out the same number, close to the same number, of fish that you put in. There's always a little bit of, you know, mortality, especially with something as long of a window that, is, that we have to work with. So, yeah, I think that's it on that. When we come back and harvest them, we do it in the winter months because that's when the, the fish start to egg up. So the eggs will start to form in like October, and if you would catch paddlefish and, uh, and do an autopsy on it, you would see in the fat part of the belly, it would look like it was flecked with pepper. Um, by Thanksgiving, there's, there, all that has turned into little eggs, um, and then by... Mm, February, March, April, the eggs are big, big. And I, I get paid by the gram, so I'm always going for the largest egg that I can within reason for, you know, high quality. If you go later than that, and the, the old-time fishermen, because you can fish them out of the Ohio River if you live in Kentucky and if you're licensed. If you live in Ohio, it's against the law, so even the Kentucky commercial fishermen have to be really careful about not crossing over that line in the middle of the river. But um, I would... I would uh, trade notes every once in a while with people that I knew that old-timey Kentucky fishermen, and they said that pretty much when the red buds are in bloom is when you stop. And you can see, even towards the end, I mean, I've experienced, like, I know exactly the day that we were going to stop, because the fish eggs, they get, uh, they get almost like a little foamy or something when you're, when they're, and since I'm not a commercial fisherman, I can just put that fish back and get it next year. It's not like I lose out on that fish. So I'm very, we're very careful about the the quality. What we do is we put in a large mesh gill net. Uh, we float it so it's a, it's a square. We go anywhere from four to six inches usually, so eight to t uh, 12 inches on the diagonal. Because these fish are so big, nothing else, we really never catch other fish. I mean, every once in a while we'll get a carp or some, you know, slimy, smelly carp in the net <laughs> that you have to take out, but you just push it over the, you know, put it on over the side and it doesn't kill it or anything. So, um, so we uh, float the nets, you know, we go out with a fish finder, try to figure out where the fish are, because the lakes we stock are big. I mean, I, the littlest lake I stock is 20 acres, 20 to 300 acres is where I, I have my fish stocked. And uh, then, then we'll put the, uh, the gill nets in. We found that a platform boat works best for us because the John boats that a lot of people use for aquaculture, boy, getting those 90, sometimes they're 90 pounds fish over the side, you know, it's a little too teetery, so we really like the platform boat. I like to bring them back. Um, we just make a little incision in the jawbone and tie a rope there, and then we just put them over to the side while we're pulling the rest of the fish in so that they stay by the boat, kind of like a live well, but kind of more like a, like they do with tuna, except I think they tail tie tuna, so. Um, we put them in, again, a fish box that has oxygen. Uh, we bring them back to our place. They settle down for a day or two. We have a little system at our place where we have a, a couple big, like, kiddie pools, basically, like children's pools that we have on the side of our lake. And uh, we have about a two-acre lake. And it's, uh, there's water constantly going in it, and then we have a sub-pump so it 
it, uh, when it reaches a certain level, all the water discharges. So the water turns over in there probably like seven times a day in each of these pools. So we put the paddlefish in there, and even though they're really big, they settle down. They, they love to swim in a circle. So they just get into the circle, and they're fine, and we let them settle down for a couple days. And then um, now we live in the country, and the reason why we did that was because we needed that little lake, and we have our, our, our own processing room. So then we bring them in for processing. So, um, you know, we try to, to humane, humanely kill the fish, basically. I mean, I was a vegetarian for a lot of my life. I wasn't even sure if I was going to be able to be a fish farmer. And I'm, I'm sort of like, uh, who's that lovely lady that, uh, she comes to Ohio State every once in a while. She's, um, she's the one who reinvented the cattle. Temple Grandin. I'm like Temple Grandin. You know, until their meat, they're an animal, and you need to treat them with respect. Because when they're living, you need to treat them with respect. So basically, they tease me about this. I always sever the notochord right away. So if they could possibly feel anything, they no longer can. So it's a really quick cut. And then, um, because these fish are so muscular, and they're, so they're like sharks. They swim to breathe. They're always moving, um, even in the winter. That's why we can harvest them in the winter. I didn't mention that before. Most fish hibernate at the bottom of a, the lake, and the paddlefish are always swimming around, which is why we, we can collect them. Um, but we sever the notochord, cord. We bleed them. Um, they go onto the table clean off the belly. We use vodka because I grew up in the phys, uh, food business, and in the food business, you never do anything that would be food that you couldn't eat or consume. I mean, I'm sure you could use rubbing alcohol, but I just wouldn't. I use a high alcohol vodka. Um, clean the belly. The ovaries are removed. They, they're passed through a window into a separate room, so they're not, never close to all the rest, you know, blood and guts kind of part. And then um, the salting goes on, the caviar making goes on in one room, and the fish cleaning goes on in the other. And uh, caviar is a lot, again, like wine, it's, very, it's a very simple process, but there's a million little things you can do for quality, just like wine. You know, wine will make itself in the wild. If you break the grape, the sugar will, there's natural yeast on the skin, it will start eating the sugar, it will ferment, you know. But there's, that being said, there's a million things you can do to wine to make it. So it's kind of the same way for us. And then we tin it, we tin it ourselves. We tin it and then we take it to market. So um, we do direct sales to consumers. I have uh, people that call me or they'll order it from the website. We also do direct sales to restaurants and retailers. And then if, I'm, if I have enough, I try to be careful not to, um, you don't want to, you want to create it like a, a little bit of buzz about your brand, but you don't want to get people excited and then not be able to supply them. So we open up, we try to do one market at a time, you know, that we're opening. Uh, so I have a distributor in Chicago that will sell my, when I have enough, they sell my product in Chicago. You know, this year we're going to have a pretty big harvest, so we've been talking about, you know, do we, what do we do next? Um, as, as far as, but I'll probably just open up one more city uh, this year. And I think that's it. Oh, make a connection. That's the other thing that's really important. Um, when you're out on your farm and you're all by yourself and you're doing your stuff and there's certainly enough things to fill your mind and your day with just raising fish or with making, um, making food a food product, it's really easy to just be uh, kind of hunkered into your own little world. It's very important to make a connection. So if people call me, I always answer the phone. Even if I, you know, I always answer an email, even if it's, you know, a goofy email like, hey, ha tell me your secrets on how you do this because we want to maybe do it. You know, I'm always very polite about, you know, about, but I make sure I answer every email. If an aquarium calls me and wants uh, fish for their display, I'm happy to donate them. If a university wants fish from me, I'm happy to donate them. I've, I've benefited a lot from university research and I want as many people to see those fish as I as possibly can. So like my Shedd Aquarium, Shedd is in Chicago, um, they come down every couple years and, and get fish from me. And because of that, I'm part of their gala. This was something that their chef put together. He displayed my tins with my brand on it for a thousand people that came to the Shedd who had the kind of income that would be interested in buying caviar, you know? And uh, we were there, we, we donated a kilo of caviar for the event, which we served and we chatted with people. And it really helped me open up the Chicago market a lot better. Newport Aquarium, I can't tell you how many people that I'll talk to about paddlefish and they'll be like, 
oh yeah, I saw those at the Newport Aquarium. It's like, oh, those are my fish. And there, you know what I mean? It just, it opens up a, a lot of uh, opportunities. Ohio Aquaculture Association is, I've been on several different boards for like agriculture or aquaculture. It's a really, really good uh, organization. They're very helpful. Um, the dues aren't very, very high and they're, 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 everybody's pretty open with making sure other people are successful. I mean, nobody's going to like, I don't know, like I said, give you their, your trade, their trade secrets or anything, but it's a, it's a very supportive um, organization. There's a lot of uh, knowledge. Slow Foods, you know, I'm, I'm doing Slow Food. Slow Food has been an uh, edible, the edible, um, I meant to put them down. Edible Ohio Valley is the one that we get. We I've got, edible Columbus. so same, that, that magazine has been, they did an article several years ago on what we were doing. And I can't tell you how many times people call me and say, I was looking at, so maybe, so the most spectacular was, I had a chef out in Monterey Bay who said I was going through everybody's edibles to, you know, to figure out what I wanted to do for this food and wine, you know, the magazine Food and Wine, it was one, of, it was their big tasting. And he said, and I came across your article and I really want to do your caviar. So we got to send a fish and caviar out there and it was, you know, it was like some of the most affluent foodie people in the world that, that um, did that. And they actually, they bought the caviar, but they slow, it was, it came through Slow Foods. Um, Community Farm Alliance, that's a Kentucky organization I really like. National Aquaculture Association. Dues are a little higher, but if you join the OAA, the Ohio Aquaculture Association, they'll give you the news alerts from National Aquaculture, so you don't really need to join that one. So that's a really a good benefit. I think that's it. Is that it? Yep. Did you guys have any questions? I was going to, so I'm, I've got a little segment I'm going to talk about HACCP just a little bit and a little bit about um, farm loans. A, a yes. Question, do paddlefish coexist with others? Yes. Okay. Perfectly. So they They're gentle. They're such a gentle fish and, okay. and they don't even eat the same thing. So every once in a while you'll have a really avid fisherman who will say, oh, we don't want to put paddlefish in there. They'll eat the zooplankton and that's what baby bass eat. We don't want the baby bass to, population to be stunted. But KSU has done a fair amount of research on that, on Daphnia levels in lakes that have been stocked with paddlefish. And it does not fluctuate because Daphnia, it's like they, when they all can become female, and you know what I mean, they just fill the void, whatever it is. Also, baby fish eat on the edge of the pond or the lake where they're safe from big fish, and paddlefish eat about five feet out into the water, so they're not even occupying the same, the same space. All right, so... When we decided we were, okay, first of all, I want to say I am not teaching a HACCP class. So to do a HACCP class, you have to go, and I, for some reason, oh, I think it is on here at the end. I've got the website of where you sign up for UC Davis HACCP class. And basically, it's a, it consists of a, a computer, a couple modules that you do where you answer questions and submit them, and then you have to go for one day of uh, with a certified FDA person to, um, to become certified to write. So I'm just giving you my experience of HACCP. I just want to be clear. And fish processing. HACCP stands for Hazard Analysis and Critical Control Points. I think it's a good idea for any farm. So uh, because HACCP is, uh, is a way that you can, it gives you more opportunity for sales. So if you're growing the fish, and you can actually sell the fish, then you get to pay yourself twice. You get to, if that makes sense, you know, like you're getting a different price. If you're just selling it to somebody, you have to sell it for $2. If you're processing it yourself, you can sell it for $8, maybe. You know, um, so for every uh, layer of, um, that you can do, you actually do make more money for everything that you can do with a product. It's sort of like somebody that's growing wheat is not making the same price as somebody that's selling bread as a finished product. So um, the thing that's really I love about um, HACCP is it helps you organize your process. You have to really be very specific about what you're doing. Even if you don't ever decide to do a HACCP plan, I think the exercise of going through what you would do is really, really helpful. You'll know your business very, very well. Um, the other thing that HACCP is good for is it makes you document, and maybe this is the most important thing, 
is you're documenting your farm's safe practices. So say there's, uh, say somebody gets, God forbid, sick from eating my caviar down, you know, what they'll do is FDA would come to me and say, can I see your records? And I can show them that everything that I did was good. That means the person that got it after me or once they got it home or something. I mean, they do a forensic where did this go wrong when somebody gets sick. It's very important to them. And what HACCP does is it helps you protect yourself by documenting that everything you've done is correct. Um, HACCP is sort of something, it's a... Uh, it's built on a foundation, so it's not it's not its own thing. Um, it represents a uh, sort of uh, preventative way, not um, not a reactive way to control foodborne illnesses. Basically, what you're doing, I think it, I think it was actually developed by like Pillsbury for the astronauts. So they they developed this program of like let's think of all the things that could go wrong, and is that a is that a critical thing or is that no big deal kind of thing. And uh, what happened is FDA adopted it for, um, first for fish, but now they use it, I think, in garden, like vegetables and things like that. So we are, if you're processing fish, you're um, monitored by the FDA, not USDA. If you do a, a warm-blooded animal, then you have to have a USDA person there. But with a cold-blooded fish, there aren't the same uh, worries of crossover pathogens because they're so different from we are what we are. Basically, if something goes wrong with fish, if fish spoils, it's going to be, it's, it would smell so bad you would need it anyway. You know, that it, there's, there's some natural safeguards that are kind of built into it. It's not a zero risk system and you have to be really careful when you sit down to write your plan because you get in this little groove and all of a sudden you're like, what if the, what if uh, there's a windstorm and, you know, something blows in and I don't, you can like overdo it. It's not a zero risk, but what you're doing is a normal daily working of this fish, you're trying to really minimum, minimize any sort of risk. So you start with your standard, uh, your SSOPs is what they call it, just making sure, let's see, did I, did I, yes, so sanitation is, your, is the bottom layer of the pyramid. And that's basically making sure your water source is safe and your ice is safe. So if you're on a farm and you've got pond water, I can speak, you have to have it certified that it's, that it's good. If you're hooked up to city water, I, it's probably, I, I always print a copy of the report and keep it in my HACCP book of the city's report. Obviously, anything I'm using for processing is fine because they're letting people drink it, so it's passing the, um, you want to make sure there's no uh, cross-contamination in your process. You know, cutting boards are clean, knives are clean, everything gets sterilized every, or washed down with a little bleach water every four hours, processing room temperature is cold, all that kind of stuff. Hand washing, very important, you know, making sure your equipment, so it's, it's really pretty much, it's very logical, but when you actually sit down and write it, it helps you understand it in a better way. You know, uh, you have to be careful about labeling and storaging, you know, where, uh, storage, sorry, where are you uh, keeping different things, how are you keeping different things, you know, your cleaning supplies need to be well away from your, like a restaurant, from your food supplies, you know, your, um, and, and you're also keeping track of those kinds of things, where they come in, who, who sold them to you. Employee health, you know, obviously you don't want somebody with tuberculosis coughing in your caviar. Maybe less than that. You know, maybe you don't want somebody with an open bloody, or a Band-Aid on their hand, not processing fish without a glove on, for instance. Um, you want to make sure there's, you know, you, you have mouse traps around in case a mouse would, you, you want to make sure there's no flies. I mean, we don't have that kind of worry because, at least insects, because we harvest in the winter. So, but you know, you, you want to write down what could possibly be a pest and how am I going to, how am I going to um, make sure that that's not a problem in my processing room. Um, good manufacturing processes, practices are the next sort of tier. And it's basically, so these are things that aren't necessarily the law, but maybe there are things that you want to include in your process. Um, you're good manufacturing uh, practices. So um, I'm trying to think of one that would be a good manufacturing practice for me that isn't, uh, isn't a rule. But anyway, you, you think about your whole process and you're, you're, you're setting up very sound ways that you're doing that. Um, when you get down to write your plan, 
you want to assemble a team of experts. It shouldn't just be you, actually. You should have a, a couple other people that participate in it. And for me, my husband received the certification as well. And he's a man, so we think differently. So it was nice to have both of us looking at the plan, you know. Um, Dr. Mims had done a lot of research. I used his plan, you know, he let me use his plan for, and, and gave me input on it. There were a lot of things that I referenced in my plan at, that were scientific studies. So I didn't actually have to have that person there, but that, those studies became part of my plan and kind of sort of the foundation of, of the science behind how we did it. Um, you have to describe your product, the intended use, and the consumer. That seems so basic, but actually, again, when you, when you think about it, it's like, oh, all right. So I'm selling meat directly to consumers, to restaurants, to distributors. Um, I'm selling caviar in this way. Uh, they want, you know, I sell meat on ice. I sell caviar in shipping boxes. You know, it makes you, makes you define what, um, what you're selling and how you're going to sell it. You have to do a flow chart that will give you an idea of the, the entire process. So for us, my flow chart comes in. I receive both male and female paddlefish. So the first thing we're going to do is we're going to make a decision on which, which we're working. If it's a female, we clean them with vodka, actually not with alcohol. Um, the ovaries are removed. And then the process becomes the same if it's a male or female. So the fish is, uh, is cleaned. You know, the offal is gone. It's either bulleted or filleted. We store it on ice or we freeze it right away, uh, depending on, on, and then in the end, it's either delivered on ice to customers, well, it, or that's the only way I deliver it, actually, because it's too big to put in a shipping box, and I'm not going to ship, you know, meat. Um, if it's a female, the ovaries are rinsed, they're screened, they're salted, they're drained, they're packaged, they're stored in refrigeration, they're delivered on ice or shipped in, with, you know, gel packs and shipping boxes. So that's my flowchart. By just doing your flowchart, it gives you an idea, too. Again, it, it firms up what your process is, every little step. Then you're going to um, do your standard operating um, procedures. So this is just, again, helping you think about how you're organizing your day. At the beginning of the day, I have a little list of SSOPs. Those are my standard uh, sanitation operating procedures. I have a list. And I, I go through and I check them. Like, have we checked that the bathrooms are clean? Have we checked that all the equipment is in good order? Or have we checked? So I have a checklist. I date it. I sign it. Um, we, uh, we receive, so here it says, live or very recently dead cold fish arrive for processing. The fish are cold because we pull them out of the water, and the water's you know, 40 degrees or colder. Um, I don't think I would ever process a dead fish. But when it's in your plan, you're bound by that plan. So if you say, if you say only live fish, you don't have the flexibility. So say, for instance, I'm at a lake that's 30 minutes from my house. I have one of those. And I put the fish in, and the fish is fine. And we get home 30, 30 minutes later, and the fish isn't moving. I'm going to check that caviar. Because in that 40 degree water, for that fish to just have died, do you know what I mean? That, that caviar is probably fine. Maybe it wouldn't, maybe I wouldn't. I want to have the flexibility to make that decision. So that's why it says that. Um, all fish are from lakes we either have under contract and therefore have been involved with the growers for several years. Um, so that's, again, that's, receiving is important. Uh, maybe your receiving would be, I'm harvesting the fish from my own lake. That's your receiving point. But you would write it down. Or I only harvest fish from growers I have a relationship. Whatever it is, you're gonna, that's an important part of the HACCP plan. Cleaning fish. Basically, just you know, knives and cutting boards are inspected. Boards and knives are clean. Cleaning is time is sufficiently. So basically, you're, you're wanting to make sure nothing gets over 40 degrees, like the flesh or whatever. And it is pretty. They're cold. We fillet them pretty quickly. They go directly on ice. And the, we keep our processing room very cold too, because it's in the winter. So we don't put any heat in there at all. Um, Let's see. If it looks like we're worried about it, we've got a thermometer that we'll check and, um, to make sure everything's staying at that. And you need a, you need a NIST thermometer when you're doing uh, it's a, what does that stand for? Do you know? It's a, it's a cer certified thermometer, basically. It's not just any uh, 
and you send it in to get recalibrated every once in a while. So they want to they want to make sure that your the things that you're using are um, properly certified by others. Um, the fish is so storage is important. You know, it's either on ice or in water. This is just for my meat. This isn't my caviar one. I do a different one for caviar. So you have to do that for every, if you're doing smoked fish, you have to do different, every product that you're making, you have to do one of these for. Um, I also, I have an SSOP for the end of the day. Same sort of thing. We put the date at the top. We check off everything, have all of our sanitation um, points been addressed. Pro, you know, garbage is out. Ofall is taken to the compost pit. Uh, all the rags go to the laundry, you know, look, floors are washed, everything's sanitized, that sort of thing. Um, pro uh, product labeling is also a critical control point, believe it or not. So because fish um, can be an allergen, so you have to make sure, I, I really, so all fish has an invoice that says paddlefish on it. Basically, I'm not selling somebody like, oh, I don't know, protein, I don't know, <laughs> but they, uh, and I, put, I always put a sticker on it. Uh, local deliveries are made in meat coolers. If the fish goes to another uh, city, there's a, we pack them in wax seafood boxes on ice, and then go into a refrigerated truck. I brought these books for you guys to look at. So these are the two, the two books that you're working out of. And basically, it's a little bit like doing your taxes. Like it feels overwhelming at first, but it's really, really well laid out. So what, what FDA wants is they don't want to get in the business of writing your own plan because they don't feel like they know your business well enough. They want you to write your own plan. But there are several um, references to anything that you might be doing that's in that book. So say, for instance, um, you did, uh, what would be one? Bass. Bass would be. So these are what, in their opinion, these are the things that are considered hazards. So there's the biological hazard with bass. No, there's none. Um, so there's no critical control points with that. The chemical, there is. So that's something you're going to have to address in your plan. And the chemical is just uh, they worry about medicated feed or poisons that could actually get into your lake. So anyway, this gives you a pretty good idea. Going through the book, you can look up your species, and it'll tell you what critical com control points that you're going to have to address. Um, and then it'll go through. Uh, how to address them. And you, there's a, usually there's three or four different options, and you're going to find the one that works best for you. And so I think this is the chemical one that we did. And um, so you understand the ha understanding the potential of the hazard. That's kind of important. So you know how to act, you know, to address it. So for, with caviar, for instance, one of my, one of my hazards is uh, botulism, which is terrible. You know, I almost didn't want to get in the caviar business when I read that. But once you understand the nature of bot botulism, you know what control points are there that will make it never happen. Do you know what I mean? So you can produce, you understand the nature of the, the pathogen, and then you can make sure that your, pl your plan is built in a way that it's really sound and it would never happen. So anyway, it goes through and tells you, and it, it does that for all fishery products. So if you want to do smoked fish, if you want to raise oysters, if you want to just do any kind of seafood processing, it, that plan will reference it. And again, I think this is, I'm sorry, I'm probably messing up your camera. Fish product good. Oh, right, so like fish, if, it's, if you're going to serve it raw, if it's partially cooked. I mean, again, this is just another chart that would be in that book that's going to tell you how you have to write your plan. So this is my plan, just a little bit of it. But uh, you, every page has to have your name and address, all your contact information. I was still in Bellevue at that point, Bellevue, Kentucky. So um, what the product description is, your method of storage and distribution. Those are the things that they're most worried about. So my ingredient or processing step, the first thing I do is I receive paddlefish, identify the hazard. There could be three hazards. I'm saying there's uh, any food with no, no, no. So there's no, let's see, how did I do that? Oh, so there's no, there's no critical thing in receiving paddlefish, basically. There's no critical step. Um, there could be, oh, it is a critical step. I'm sorry. So yeah, there's, uh, there could be a chemical, uh, 
a chemical problem with receiving fish. That's the thing that FDA is worried about. And it's what I mentioned before. Do you use medicated feed? Is there a chance that there could be a toxin in the water that you're working with? So that does absolutely have to be addressed. Um, so again, it says what it is, environmental or contaminant uh, pesticides. That's the chemical uh, hazard that you're going for. Okay, what control measures are to be applied and who does it? Um, basically what we do is we make sure that we have a, we only work with lakes that we contract. We're not receiving fish from other places. And we have a, a certificate on file with the lakes that we work with that says they haven't ever used, there's no reason to use medicated feed, so that's not an issue. And that nobody's treated the lake with anything that would be toxic to food fish. And anytime they have a question, like if somebody has an algae bloom or something like that, they always call me, you know, are we allowed to use this chemical? You can look it up. Yes, fine. Go right ahead. Um, so we receive paddlefish, ovaries removed. Um, there is one hazard which could be botulism in the ovaries. Um, but do I need to address it at that step? No, I'm going to address that, that hazard with the salting down the road. So although it is a critical control point, I don't need to address it at this particular point. So basically, you're just going through your whole process and um, talking about when you have to, to fix it. Modern, how do you monitor that you controlled that? So again, it'll go through, I'm sorry, this, I know this is boring stuff, but um, so if transportation, who monitors it, a big fish employee or me, you know, we. All of my coolers that I have for freezing, I have a caviar freezer, a refrigerator, and a deep freezer. I keep little probes in there, and they're, the information goes to the cloud. I print out a report every week that documents what the temperatures were, and then I sign it. You have to keep a constant, because temperature is a very important critical control point for me. So that's how I do that. Um, so, basically. So this is the... Um, seafood HACCP from Cornell. Again, my process is a little more complicated than maybe you would do if you were just making food fish. So I don't want to scare anybody away. But uh, you just go there and they'll, they'll, you sign up. I think it's like $60. It's really not very expensive at all. And, um, and then, um, then they'll, they take the classes around the country. So it's always within two hours of the big city. Like sometimes they'll be in Lexington, sometimes they'll be in Columbus. I think that's it. Um, oh, so working with other industry segments. Even if you're only partially involved in the process, you need to document your part. So say you're, uh, you're a grower and you're selling your fish to somebody else. You might want to say, you, want, you might keep a log of everything that you did to that body of water that year so that if somebody gets sick down the road and they, they, they're trying to trace it back, they come to you. It's like, no, we use no pesticides. There's no pesticides in the surrounding area. We didn't use medicated feed. Just document it. You can say it, but by writing it down, it becomes more of a, of a journal record. Um, if, you're, if you're receiving, um, so if I was buying caviar from somebody, already made, which I don't know why I would, but if I did, I would want to make sure that, uh, that they were HACCP certified, and I would write that in my log. I'd want to make sure the temperature that I received the caviar at was adequate, and then I would take over my records from there, that from that moment on, my storage or any kind of repackaging that I did was, um, was solid and you know, sanitary and that I documented it. So even if you're only partially involved, um, if you're shipping fish, like if you're just transporting fish, you need to uh, fish that's already, you know, it, meat that's fillets or something like meat. You're gonna, you would have to have a temperature controlled truck, or you could say um, it could be on ice and the ice is visible. You, you, that's how you can tell the temperature is where it is because the ice is visible. But you would have to stop every four hours and document that that was the case to show that when you delivered it, yes, here are my records. You know, I, I'm driving it from Florida to New York, but even though my truck isn't temperature controlled, we, we added ice every four hours, yes, visibly. And you know, the, ladies, the lady at HACCP, I didn't think that was enough of a control, but she was like, no, if you bring it to somebody and it's on ice, then you know what temperature it is. 
in the early days when we got started, one of the things that we did for the freezer, because I didn't have my freezer uh, temperature alert thing set up, and this was a trick that my husband taught me from the restaurant business, is you take a, uh, a half bottle of water and you uh, freeze it standing up, and then you lay it in the freezer like this. And if you come back and it's still all in this half, you know the freezer has never warmed above do you know what I mean? So there are some other, there are some things that you can do, and, and that's a real process. I wrote that down. I documented that that's what happened. You know what I mean? Yes, we came. The bottle was like this. You know, every, that's my, that was my record keeping for that. So, all right, I think that's it. Do you have any questions? So uh, again, I am not a USDA farm loan person, but I have received one of those loans. So I'm just going to talk to you about my experience. Um, this is a really, this is a fabulous program, actually, for people that want to, want to get into farming. Um, what USDA, here, let's see if I documented this out. All right, so great place to start. There's a lot of paperwork involved with this loan. And again, even if you don't do the loan, going through the paperwork will help you know your operation much, much better. I mean, you have a tendency to think, oh, I know what's going on. And then you sit, somebody will say, how many fish do you have in the water? Huh. How many legs do you have stocked? Well, you know, you have to, it's like going through the process and writing everything down is really, really helpful. The USDA doesn't want to compete with a private bank, um, but they're in a position to take a greater risk. So if you go to Farm Credit Services and they're like, you have no collateral, you have, I, I, we couldn't possibly loan you that money in good faith, you can go to the USDA and the USDA will take a risk on you if they think you're worth it because they want people to raise food and um, they know how important it is. <laughs> that's, that's out over my lake. That was a great day. Um, so the loan application is different than a regular, um, than a regular bank loan. A lot of times when you're buying a house, you go to the bank and they say you can spend $150,000 and then you go find a realtor and you say I'm approved for $150,000 and they show you those kind of houses. Um, with FDA, they're not going to tell you anything until you find the property. So you have to find the property, property first and the loans take more than 60 days to approve. So you have to find the right kind of buyer, seller, I'm <coughs> sorry, that's going to be willing to sell. So a lot of times that's somebody that... Um, that wants to make sure that their farm stays as a farm. And they don't care if it takes you 60 days to close instead of 30 days to close, you know, because they want to make sure that it's going to, it's going to stay a farm. Or maybe it's a, maybe it's a property that had, needs some work and it's been on the market for a while and you can go and say, you know, I'll give you a, your asking price, but it's going to take me a while to close on this. And a lot of times they're like, oh, fine. What I, you, anyway, you have to use a little, or, or it needs some work and you don't mind doing the work, and you tie that into your loan, whereas the average person wants to move in and live there right away and have everything be hunky-dory, maybe you're willing to buy a property that you're going to do some stuff anyway, so you might, you might just, um, that might not be a problem for you. Um, they have to accept your offer before you can actually submit the paperwork. So um, you have to have a signed contract with them that says, yes, we'll, we'll sell you this house or this farm for X amount of money, and we know it's going to take you a while to close because you're going to go through um, farm service agency. That's what that means. Um, I found this astounding. I did this for a little, uh, I can't remember even what project this was, but I thought I'm just going to look in the census and see what the average size farm is and what the average size acreage is. And what I came up with is that the average size farm for the average amount of acreage came out to $800,000. So I think it was 400 acres, $2,000, something like that. You know, so to get into farming, if you don't own the land, it's really, is really tough. Um, Property values are $9,000 an acre. Really? In Ohio? Mm -hmm. Wow. So um, this, is, this is the website that has all of their loans. And again, you guys are going to have access to this. Um, I, can, I haven't checked on them in a couple years, but I can tell you the loans that, that we did. So this was the loan program at the time. There was a, a farm operating direct loan. The interest rate is 2.750. It's really cheap. And actually, I'm going to apply for an operating loan this year because um, what I do is I pay my 
my farms, my partners, my ranching partners, I pay them within 60 days of the end of the harvest. I give them a check for their percentage. Well, I don't, it takes me a whole year to sell that product. So an operating loan, they'll, they'll do for me at a really low interest rate. I'm going to pay it off in six months. Do you know what I mean? And because I'll have the money in six months. But then my, I don't have to, I don't have to plead with my ranching partner like, oh, can you give me a little more time? What? You know, I can just write them a check and pay it. So that's a really great, a great loan. The micro, uh, the micro loan, I did that, I did that through, um, that's how I got my um, water activity meter, was a micro loan. Uh, direct uh, ownership, that's where they'll, um, they will pay 100% of the farm bill for you. They'll finance it. Um, when I was doing it, you had to spend, let's see, if I can remember this. You could spend up to $300,000, and the interest rate was like 2%. And you had 40 years to pay it. Now, they don't really want you to take 40 years to pay it. So, but they're going to give you, so they, they set it up like that. So when I said they don't want to compete with banks, what they're going to do is they're taking a, a chance on you by letting you get into the game at a really low monthly nut. Actually, it's yearly for that kind of thing. Um, you Just one payment a year is what you come up with. And then they're going to audit you every year to see how your farming operation is doing. And once you're doing well enough, they're going to push you off onto a regular bank. Their goal is to get rid of you as quickly as possible. And that's really your goal in the end anyway. You don't want to be on that loan for 40 years because that means you haven't really accomplished what you wanted to accomplish. But what it does is it gives you breathing room to get up and running with a low in interest payment. So every year they send me the paperwork. I have to fill it out. You know, they'll come out and check, ch you know, chat with me like, how are you doing? Um, this is good. No, you're not ready yet. We're not worried about you yet. Let's, you know, we'll see you next year. That kind of thing. Um, we ended up doing a joint financing, and uh, my FSA agent was the one that talked me into that. I loved, actually, one of the reasons we ended up in Claremont County is that the loan agent at Farm Service Agents Agency, she understood what we were trying to do. And some of them didn't. And I just thought, wow, this is going to be such a fight. And she totally got it. And I thought, I'm buying in Claremont County because I want her to be the one that's in charge of my loan. So I, can, I could live many places and do what we're doing. She said, you're going to want a relationship with a real bank. She goes, it's fine, we'll take care of you, but, but down the road you're going to need, you're going to have, I want you to have years worth of relationships with a real bank. So what they do is they, they split the amount of money that I spent, they carry half the load, a bank carries the other half the load. They go to the bank and they say, you know what, we're going to guarantee that, we feel so sure we're going to guarantee that loan for 90 percent. So the bank doesn't mind giving it to you because if you default, they're going to get 90% of their money back. So it's, it makes you, it helps you have a, a more secure relationship with your bank from the very beginning. So I was kind of glad she talked me into that. So my regular loan, I pay like a mortgage payment. My FSA loan, I pay once a year. Um, they actually have a down payment loan. If you just, if you think you can do it, but you don't have the down payment, there's a loan program for that. 1.5%. I mean, it's really... Um, Emergency loan or actual loss speaks for itself. So let's see. By providing credit and offers opportunities to family-sized farms, right, so to start or improve, this is basically what they're, what they're looking for. I felt like I was a beginning farmer or rancher. Um, that was the loan that I was really going for in the beginning because um, and the definition of a beginning farmer is or rancher is that you've been f actively farming for more than two years, less than 10 um, and that, uh, so you have a little bit of knowledge about the kind of stuff that you're doing. And then, then it was, it was sort of that direct loan, like, you know, 40 year, said 2% for $300,000 or something. Um, you can use it for urban stuff. There's a young people one, and then the operating loan I think I talked about. And that's pretty much the same thing again. Microloans. Minority and women farmer and ranchers. What that did for me, actually, honestly, the minority of farming thing is it put me at the top of the list. So they only have so much money every year that they're going to give out. And uh, I think they were able to fund everybody in that year. I don't think I took it away from anybody else, but they put me to the top of the list as far as funding went because I'm, I'm a, because there aren't, there haven't historically been very many women farmers. 
but you have to be realistic. So you're gonna, you cannot go to a FSA agent and say, I have, a, I have this really great idea and I know it's gonna be great and not have done it at all. I mean, they want you to have a little experience into what you're, so for us, we did it, we were living in the city, we were doing our tanks, so I had experience raising fingerlings, and we were um, selling fish to, like, Jones and aquarium fish, so we had a little bit of, you know, knowledge. We knew how, we knew how the caviar stuff was going to work down the road, so it wasn't a pie-in-the-sky plan. A lot of times people will say, like, I just can't wait to quit my job and farm. That's what I really want to do, quit my job and farm. You can do that, but you have, to, you have to know something about farming. You have to try in some way to know, know a little bit about it before they'll, they'll, um, they'll do that. Um, but your other experiences count towards that, too. So it doesn't have to actually be, maybe you have experience. So I had a lot of sales experience when I was in the restaurant and the wine business. They knew that when I got to the selling of the caviar part because of my background, that that would not be an obstacle for me. So they didn't feel like that was going to hold me back from taking this whole cycle into completion. Um, if you can just show you can do the work on a small scale, they will be happy to bump you up to a larger scale operation. Um, get ready for lots of paperwork. <laughs> so it really is, it, it, but it's really, it's worth it. Our problem was some of the forms didn't really fit what we were doing, so we had to, re we had to kind of create forms, but anyway, it was very helpful. Um, and this is where you get to really know your operation, like all of it. Your, what do you have is in your inventory already? What are your, you know, what's your bank balance? What's the projection that you're going to have in three years financially? What do you think you're going to get? Um, and you have to write a business plan, which probably many people have already written one, but those are the components. They want to know, um, it's often, it's uh, often way more, what do you think? Organization. So yeah, so these were just the, these are the categories you have to um, hit with your uh, business plan. And sometimes you can bring in people from other segments that will help you with that. And they can be listed as, you know, uh, I forget what, what we listed them as. And I'm surprised I don't have it list. But anyway, you know, you don't have to do it all by yourself, basically. And there's a lot of things with the uh, colleges where they'll, or, um, what is it, small business associations will help you write business plans. You have to do a balance sheet, assets and liabilities, income and expense schedules, projected annual cash flow, livestock inventory, three-year production history, three-year financial history, uh, description of the farm training experience, and a profit and loss sheet. Those are basically the things. But your farm service agent will totally walk you through that. It's not very intimidating. And to get your foot in the door, to owning a farm, for me, that was well worth it to go through that sort of paperwork. And again, it helped me know my business a lot better. Um, find, okay, so when you're looking for the, um, you have to find a real estate agent that knows what you're talking about. We looked for a farm for like four years. I was constantly on the multiple listings, you know, trying to find stuff. What we found is that farm property that went up for sale, uh, the minute that you bid on it, the guy down the street that was his neighbor that had been looking at it came in and said, you know what, I'll give you your asking price on that. And they so it, it was on the, good farm property was on the multiple listings for like a week. And um, so what you need is you need to find a real estate agent that knows kind of what you're looking for and knows the, the minute we found somebody, we, had a, we found our property like within a month. It was amazing. You just... Um, I guess I can't overestimate how important it is to find the right real estate agent. Uh, find the right bank. Um, and then this is, if there's a book that was written in the, um, in the 30s that I love. It's a great like farming book called Ten Acres and in Independence. Have any of you ever heard of it? It was kind of formative, like all the, anyway, he talks about how easy it is to, to get this idea of farming and then to buy a farm that doesn't actually have the natural resources that you need because you're enchanted by the property for some other reason. Like if I would have wanted to grow vegetables, my farm right now, I would be, I would have defaulted on my loan. Our soil is so bad, you know, I have, I really struggle with even having a garden, but it looked great, you know, when I bought it and I didn't know that about the soil. If you want to have an orchard, you better make sure your property drains really well. If you want to, whatever you want to do. If you want to have aquaculture, the first farm that we almost bid on, this is so silly to even say this out loud, we didn't look at the groundwater table. 
It was dry as a bone. You would have had to go down 200 feet or something to hit the water table. It was, but we didn't even think about that in the beginning. We're like, oh, we could make our processing room here, and look, there's a nice pond, and you know, if you're going to do aquaculture, you need water. Um, what do you expect once you get your FSA loan? So, yeah, your FSA agent, she's not going to be your cheerleader or he, but they do want you to be successful. So if you run into a snag, you can go to them. And I mean, I was sitting in her office one time when there was somebody there with goats that was having trouble. And I could, she was talking them off the ledge, like, you're not going to default. Just relax. You know, we're going to, have you thought about this? They want you to be successful. Um, you have the yearly audits, which I already mentioned, and um, that you're transitioned to a real bank. Before, you know, you, there's no way you're going to be on there for 40 years, but it just lowers your, month, your monthly nut. Is that it? That's it. Do you have any questions about that? All right. Well, thank you very much. I appreciate it.